Hello and welcome to Shaka Extra Time, a show appearing here on Facebook Live. And joining me today is uh, my colleague, Jackson Mvongani, uh, the host of VOA's Upfront. Jackson, welcome. Thank uh, you, to, Paul. Uh, Shark Extra Time. Thank you very much. Uh, good to have you again. Thank you. Uh, so what's good uh, what to be have here? You, yeah, uh, a warm welcome to you all, our Facebook our followers are watching us live. Uh, uh, Shark Extra Time is a place where you get to talk to Shaka. Unfortunately, Shaka is out today, but uh, uh, my colleague uh, Jackson is sitting in for Shaka, so he will be taking your questions uh, in a minute. But mm -hmm. uh, let's uh, start uh, in uh, New York. Uh, the 73rd uh, General Assembly, UN General Assembly, is uh, taking place. Right. Uh, we've had uh, some speakers uh, speak this far. Uh, for example, the President of the United States uh, just uh, uh, finished uh, his remarks uh, right. maybe an hour ago. Uh, your assessment so far? Uh, obviously, when uh, the General Assembly is taking place in New York, all eyes uh, turned to the UN and uh, some of the speeches, including the speech by the US President. Uh, whoever it is at the time, and this is the second time uh, Donald Trump was addressing the, the General Assembly. And uh, uh, from his speech, you could see that um, there's, uh, uh, w we've seen this retreat by the U.S., by this administration, to retreat from the global affairs of the world. Uh, he talked about how countries have the right to live, you know, to lead their own lives, their own political lives. Uh, we won't be interfering in your day-to-day -day affairs. You do what you want. Uh, and that we are going to give foreign aid to only our friends, those who like us, who have our um, best interest at heart. Those are the words of uh, President Donald Trump. I, again, to echo I guess the sentiments in his first address last year to the UN General Assembly, uh, this general retreat from global affairs. Uh, the US does not want to meddle into your internal politics. We want to do our thing, you do your thing. So long as you give us, you show us respect, we will also show you respect. Uh, surprisingly, today he came <laughs> off uh, sort of in a measured uh, tone. Mm -hmm. He wasn't as a, uh, as a uh, as fiery as he was uh, the last time he I was mean, the he, did, he did give uh, some remarks that elicited a laugh from the audience. Uh, it sounded like he, he felt almost like he was uh, speaking at a rally here in the U.S. when he's speaking to, uh, 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 to his supporters. Where talking he about talked his to, accomplishments. Uh, exactly, talking about his accomplishments, how the economy is doing so well. No, no other administration has achieved this much success in such a short time period like his administration has. And um, the, the, there was laughter in the hall. And he, he called himself. He was like, well, I did not expect that kind of uh, reaction, <laughs> which was quite interesting, too. Um, uh, he can be funny, too. It is. He, he did. He did. He stayed on, on script. Very few uh, times where he ad-libbed. Uh, but it was you know, straight speech, uh, speaking to uh, his foreign policy objectives. I, um, one of the things that he said that um, uh, I guess resonated with many African leaders uh, was uh, this uh, new policy by the U.S. Uh, to not recognize the ICC, um, and, and that uh, uh, it's, it's, it's one of uh, the things that caught uh, many human rights watchers off guard, uh, this strong anti-ICC sentiment in this administration where they say they are not endorsing uh, the ICC and that they will not, uh, I guess they, they called it, uh, we will not um, kowtow to, uh, we will not be, um, I, I don't remember the exact word, but he basically said that we, we, will not, we do not recognize the power of the ICC uh, over our people, uh, which is uh, the same um, argument that has been made for a long time by many of the, the African leaders who uh, have been either indicted or have been uh, allegedly committed uh, you know, crimes against humanity that the ICC has been investigating. I, I guess uh, there is uh, every reason uh, to worry when it comes to, uh, especially how he's been dealing with uh, immigrants mm. from, uh, 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 let's say, the Arab world mm. or the Muslim uh, countries. Mm. Uh, uh, it's not been fun. Mm. Uh, he's come under criticism for just dealing with uh, immigration in this country, later on immigration that covers uh, some of those uh, countries. Indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, let, let's talk about uh, uh, 
uh, the unveiling of uh, the Mandela statue right. yesterday. Mm. Uh, this was uh, uh, one of the most significant uh, events at uh, the UN this year. Uh, can you speak to us maybe <coughs> about uh, the symbolism of this? Why a Mandela statue at Ma the United Nations? Ma Mandela is such a global icon uh, of peace, of love, of reconciliation, and honestly, there's no one single leader uh, in our generation who is more deserving of a statue at the UN uh, than Mandela. Mm. And so this was such a great move. Uh, it's, it's one of those uh, moves that you feel that uh, uh, everybody was behind it. Um, most leaders spoke at it. Um, it, uh, it is, it's a reminder that uh, we need leaders like Nelson Mandela and that he inspires uh, young leaders on the continent and around the world uh, to be better and to serve uh, larger purposes in life than their own personal goals. And so I, I, I was uh, very happy to see this unveiling of a statue at the UN of uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, the theme this year is about uh, peace and uh, reconciliation, and uh, maybe going back to what is said about uh, Mandela, mm. one of the reasons they are honoring him uh, this year, it's because of the things that he stood for. Absolutely. Uh, that uh, peace uh, that uh, you mentioned, right. uh, the reconciliation. Uh, but to a larger extent, uh, to a larger extent, uh, our continent, Africa, is still dealing with a lot of uh, uh, issues, uh, issues yes. uh, especially in regard to mm. uh, peace and peace, security. Right, a lot of countries yeah. uh, have conflict. Mm. Uh, uh, some countries have conflict. People don't have peace. They can't sleep. Mm. Uh, your thoughts on that? No, absolutely. Um, you know, again, there's uh, no one more deserving of this uh, uh, recognition. Uh, no one single person who represents the ambitions and aspiration of a peaceful Africa that Nelson Mandela did. And that we keep him in our minds and thoughts all the time to inspire us mm -hmm. is such a great uh, honor uh, to us who've watched him in our generation, in mm -hmm. our lifetime, but also to everybody who's coming out behind us. And, and as our countries uh, around the continent grapple with issues of democracy, with human rights, reconciliation, that they can look up to him as, as a person that they can, um, that can as, inspires them. Uh, let's stay in South Africa. Let's uh, talk about uh, the couple uh, reforms are coming out of uh, South Africa. Uh, most uh, uh, significant, uh, maybe the land uh, reform. Mm -hmm, There's mm -hmm. been a lot of talk about mm -hmm. uh, the land, the land uh, reform. Mm -hmm. uh, if you remember, Zimbabwe did the same thing in uh, 2000, and it ended up the wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, the implementers of that land reform uh, just did everything impos uh, possible pro uh, to make sure the thing doesn't work. Uh, uh, what South Africa is going through, could it, could it be something that they have to avoid or it's something that uh, uh, along the way might uh, cause uh, problems? Right. Um, one of the most contentious issues in uh, South Africa right now is land reform. Uh, I think uh, President uh, Silo Ramaphosa just appointed a, a commission of about 10 people, I believe, to study this issue. Um, the, the, the thing is that in South Africa, over 70 percent of the land is owned by just 10 percent of the population. Uh, there's a lot of inequality, there's a lot of poverty, most of which is, you know, historical. Mm -hmm. And to solve these issues um, is, not issue, is not easy. There's going to be a lot of uh, uh, um, people fighting against any kind of reforms. The powers that be, the, the people that have uh, vested interests, mostly those who are the landowners, uh, and the challenges on, uh, you know, the government of Sarah Ramaphosa to handle these uh, very sensitively, you know, to, uh, again, to learn from the situation in Zimbabwe under Mugabe uh, almost uh, two decades ago. Uh, the, that experiment did not go right. Um, hopefully, this time around, uh, they will have learned something from that and that uh, Ramaphosa and this... Uh, Commission that he has set up will um, come up with uh, solutions uh, to this uh, land reform issue, land expropriation, as uh, some have called it, uh, that does not lead to uh, violence or people fighting or, you know, 
not happy. Obviously, not everybody will be happy, but at least hopefully there will be a middle ground where people feel like that uh, uh, there has been a pragmatic approach to this uh, situation. Uh, speaking of a pragmatic approach, uh, uh, land distribution uh, was a key component uh, during the apartheid uh, era. Mm. Uh, they talked about it, uh, they made promises, but those promises were never kept. Uh, today, we are talking about uh, the same issue. Mm. Uh, land is still predominantly owned by a lot of uh, white people. Absolutely. There, yeah. There's still a lot of uh, you know, inequality in South Africa. And uh, inequality is a legacy of apartheid and colonialism in that country, something uh, that has been afflicting that country for over 300 years is not something that is not an issue that you're going to resolve in one year or two years or three or four years. Mm -hmm. So I think they've been making steps toward it. Uh, this is just part of, the pro of that process. And hopefully they will, uh, they will find again that solution uh, that where everybody is happy that uh, we are doing what is in the best interest of the majority of the country mm. or everybody in the country. Uh, how about those people who say that, uh, for example, just uh, trying to address the land uh, issue is not going to solve the economic challenges uh, that are faced by the country? Absolutely. There are so many issues. I mean, land is uh, uh, a very big resource in any country. Uh, being able to solve that is uh, part of an equation. It's not the only uh, factor, uh, but I think being able to find a solution to the land issue in essence solves some of those other underlying issues of uh, inequality. Uh, still in South Africa, let's talk about uh, uh, another thing. Uh, most recently, uh, there have been discussions on how to figure out how maybe to ease getting visas into South Africa, mm. largely because of uh, the tourism potential that uh, right. uh, ha that has. Uh, can you speak to that? So South Africa makes a lot of money from tourism, but it's also one of the countries that is most inaccessible to Africans. Uh, I know, for example, Rwandans currently complain that they don't uh, get visas to South Africa easily. I mean, that's, I'm sure there's few who do, but there, there are it's, reasons yeah. why Ivanans um, don't get visas. But um, many people around the continent complain that they are locked out of uh, South Africa because um, it, it has very strict visa regulations. Uh, the fact that South Africa is going to be to join other African countries potentially because they are they are still in negotiations. Uh, they have, uh, I guess. They're saying that a couple of countries right now are going to be allowed to be visa-free. They're still negotiating on which other, which countries in the African continent will be uh, visa-free. Uh, remember, there was, I think, it was last year. Yeah. La I think it was last year when um, many countries on the continent, including Rwanda, Ghana, and others, uh, opened their borders to Africans where you can you know, easily Literal. travel without a visa. Uh, South Africa joining this bandwagon, uh, opening their borders uh, to people, I think is a good thing. It's never a bad thing to let people come and visit. Uh, ah. Part of the reason why there's a lot of xenophobia on the con in, in South Africa is that uh, this is somebody who told me this in South Africa when I was there last year, is that the country has been so closed off to Africans, to visiting, visitations uh, by other Africans. And there's, there's a lot of visitors that come from outside of Africa, I mean, to come and visit for tourism purposes in South Africa or for work, but they don't see a lot of uh, Africans unless they're coming in as migrant workers or migrants, uh, refugees or asylees. And so I think it's a commendable uh, uh, effort on South Africa's part to mm. be looking into resolving, uh, I guess, uh, uh, this issue of uh, the visa. Uh, how about people who make the Sorry, argument? Sorry, relaxing visa regulations, right, right. yes. How about the people who make the argument of uh, saying that uh, uh, compared to most countries, uh, South Africa is actually better? Uh, I remember a time when my first passport, my first passport mm. as a young kid, mm. uh, I had uh, had a big red uh, uh, issue there that said uh, you can travel to all countries except South Africa. And now we are talking about them easing visas, I am more guessing, access to people. I'm, I'm guessing that you got that passport in the 80s? Absolutely. Right. That was at the time when yeah. South Africa was under heavy travel restriction uh, by most African countries because it was an apartheid government and uh, they had uh, most African governments were as a way to protest 
the apartheid regime had stopped, uh, refused their citizens to go visit South Africa. So I guess that's how you got your passport when most countries had, uh, had those restrictions. Right, mm -hmm. right, yeah. So where's uh, that passport? Do you still have it? I still have it. I still <laughs> have it. Uh, it's amazing how things have changed. A lot of people go to South Africa for greener pastures. Right. Uh, the people that I know in South Africa are doing very well mm. compared to other countries right. they have come from. But you cannot overlook mm. the fact that also South Africa has been very restrictive to uh, visitations by other Africans. Also, we, we, we cannot uh, overlook the fact that there's, you know, the issue of xenophobia that keeps yeah. railing its ugly head time to time in South Africa, where South Africans uh, um, brutalize fellow Africans who were there with them during the days of apartheid and such a shame. Uh, you are watching the Shaka Extra Time, a show that comes to you live uh, every Tuesday. Shaka Sally is off, uh, and Jackson Mvangani, the host of Upfront, is filling in for Shaka. Uh, so we'll be taking your comments uh, shortly. Uh, before we go to the comments, uh, let's go back to maybe another issue that we wanted to talk about. Uh, corruption. Yes. Uh, corruption seems to be uh, an epidemic <laughs> that uh, doesn't have a cure, especially you keep hearing of these scandals. Uh, lately, you've heard of a scandal of where almost a hundred, uh, uh, nearly a hundred million dollars just disappeared. In, in, in Liberia. In transit. Right. Liberia transit. lost almost five percent of its GDP. They ordered banknotes uh, to be printed, I believe, in Sweden or some other country. Um, and the money comes in, but uh, it got lost somewhere in the, in the, you know, from where it was printed to the central bank. Somewhere the money is missing, and they've been looking. The investigations are ongoing. Uh, the son of the former president, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, was implicated in the scandal. Uh, the government of George Weir is, un is currently under pressure because I think, well, he ran on the mantle, on the platform of fighting corruption in the country. Uh, this is such a, gr a big story on the continent right now, actually around the world. I mean, how do you explain uh, a hundred million, million dollars, dollars in, 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 in a cargo uh, the size of a small room just disappearing off of a port? I mean, I track my <laughs> pennies wherever they fall. I track my dollars. And you're talking about $100 million? Yeah, yeah. Th that's insane. Right. And, and the other issue, so from the, we're still waiting to see what happens with that story and the investigation. And today, another story that broke that I, I found very interesting was that the son of the former president of Angola, uh, uh, Jose, uh, Jose Dos Santos, Santos the yeah. son who was in charge of the sovereign fund, has been arrested uh, uh, again, for corruption, apparently, in regards or related to the, the handling of the sovereign fund. Um, remember when the, pr the president, the current president of Angola, took over from uh, Dos Santos, they said he was a hand-picked person who was going to, uh, got, you know, tread carefully in handling the businesses of the, the former Fast family. Yeah. Uh, it's not looking that way. It looks like uh, this man is... Uh, is actually coming coming in strong, and uh, this was a very interesting story to read today. That the the son of the the family that had been in power for over 30 years is currently uh, being investigated for corruption. Well, you could say that the chickens are coming home to roast <laughs> uh, because those guys were used to right. really, uh, and, and using the national uh, um, uh, like uh, 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 the, the national bank as their personal ATM. Right. Uh, you would, know, the daughter mm. is one of the richest people in Africa. Absolutely. She's, uh, I think the richest um, woman in Africa. Yeah. No? Yes. Arguably yeah. the richest the, woman So the in sister Africa. to the gentleman who has been arrested. Right. Yes. So um, and that comes at how the did heels. She get those riches? It yeah. comes at the heels of the story that we we, we we talked about last week, the son of Teodoro Obiang, who is currently the vice president of Equatorio Guinea, being arrested in um, Brazil with uh, what, sixteen million dollars cash and watches and you know. So you know, when I was reading earlier, there's something that struck a chord uh, with me, uh, talking about uh, Liberia corruption. Mm. It's so endemic mm. uh, that uh, there is actually no law. Corruption in Liberia is not punishable by law. Oh, I did not know that. I did not know that. So anybody can get away with whatever they want to do. I did not know that. I did not know that. I found that to be uh, interesting, considering... Well, ho ho hopefully that, uh, the approach of the new president... Uh, uh, who is in the U.S. right now uh, attending his first uh, U.N. General Assembly, President 
uh, George Weir. I still yes. find that very interesting to say President George Weir, knowing that this guy was one of the, the best footballers the continent has ever had. Uh, we're, we're still waiting to see what he will do in terms of fighting corruption in his country. Will that football translate into uh, how he handled himself on the, on the court, on the, on the pitch, on the football <laughs> pitch? <laughs> so, okay, let's go to some comments here. Yeah. Uh, let's start uh, in Uganda. Mm. Let's start uh, uh, with uh, Frank and Wamanya. Mm. Uh, what are the implications of a peaceful DRC uh, for the whole of Africa? Right. So uh, the DRC is one of um, the world's wealthiest countries, potentially in terms of resources. Uh, I read somewhere that the DRC has over $24 trillion in untapped resources. Yeah. Uh, but the country, unfortunately, has been at war. Uh, there's been a lot of conflict in that country for the last three decades. You know, post-independence uh, uh, DRC, or former Zaire, has not known a day of peace that is fighting in Eastern Congo, Central Congo, parts of uh, the, the, the country are always in some sort of conflict, you know. Mm -hmm. um, a peaceful DRC would mean that people, uh, Congolese, would start enjoying the resources, the wealth of their country. Um, a peaceful DRC will also mean that uh, Western powers, uh, including China, will not just come in and take the resources without fully being accountable to, uh, uh, to where they, you know, where they're taking their resources and how they're taking those resources. But, a but peaceful wait, DRC you... also also mean that other Africans will benefit from the wealth and resources of the DRC. But, wait a minute, mm -hmm. Jackson. Uh, people that don't just show up at your borders and start taking resources. Yeah, and I... These are people who are going those countries right. with a, the right paperwork I, again, to, to do business. Absolutely, there. and they're the, in cahoots with the government. Absolutely, uh, of the day. absolutely. Then the yeah. issue is with the leadership of the country, the successive leadership. In the country over the years, from the days of Mobutu to the days of Kabila, uh, the plan that, that has been happening in the DRC has been in uh, they've been in cahoots with the leadership uh, and other either Western corporations or Western governments, uh, or whichever uh, figures or uh, people that have been benefiting from the resources of the DRC, but not the people of the DRC. Uh, Jackson, there's a comment from uh, Rwanda here. Since uh, you're from Rwanda, uh, Musinguzi Kato Evan wants to know why the international community has turned a deaf ear uh, to the detention of Rwandan politi politician uh, Diane Rigala. I don't think there's been, they have turned a deaf ear. I, I, feel, I feel that uh, people have spoken up. Uh, they, uh, there's been widespread... Uh, 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 condemnation. This has been part of a conversation in every circle. It's been in the media. Uh, the the Rigara issue is something that is still being litigated in the courts of law in Rwanda, adjudicated, and uh, how that turns out, we don't know yet. Uh, but I, I don't think that there has been silence. You know, people are speaking out, whether it's uh, people in uh, civil society, whether it's in the international community, whether it's international institutions or international governments. Uh, I feel like this is an issue that has been in the news and continues to be in the news as long as that case is ongoing. Uh, what, what's the progress on uh, 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 Victor Ingabire, who was just... <laughs> we talked about Victoria last week. I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I think she's a citizen like everybody else. She was, uh, um, she, she was released. Uh, with uh, not under house with arrest. others, I don't know if she's under. She she can't be as a, under because, house arrest because uh, she was released. You know for sure that Rwanda is a police state. They they are pre policy. I, I, don't, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, she's a free citizen like everybody else. I'm sure she's conducting business. And she I've seen. I think she was actually at the at, uh, at um, in court recently to when when the Anriga was there too. So mm. I feel like she's able to conduct her business like every other citizen. Now how free oh. she is, maybe that's somebody you you can call and, and talk to her and say, <laughs> <laughs> how about on the show, Paul? <laughs> yeah. Let's cross over to yeah. South Sudan. Yeah. South Sudan is another basket case. Yeah. Uh, uh, we've had uh, peace talks uh, day in, day out. Uh, everybody well, as talks. somebody likes to call them peace jokes. Y yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, as we speak today, uh, I think uh, yesterday or today, Riyak Macha said he's not going uh, to uh, Juba. Right, because there's, there's no assurance of security for yeah. him. So what peace talks are we talking about? I don't or know. what peace jokes are we I talking about? I don't know, about? man. I feel like uh, there's still a lot to be um, 
down in, in, um, in I guess, uh, the, the trust between those two individual players in this conflict, which is Riek Masha and mm. Salva Kiir. I feel like they, they don't have trust of each other. If, if uh, the former vice president and the man who you just signed a peace deal with says he's not able to visit mm -hmm. the capital city, uh, to, work, to work out whatever remaining kinks are in the peace uh, treaty or peace uh, talks, uh, it says it means to me that they, you didn't, they didn't really believe in the peace uh, agreement that they signed. Mm. So I don't know what happens. Maybe they need to bring in Museveni again. Museveni seems to be the, the power player, the power broker in that region to, so, but the guy to has give him a show for a very long time and he, he has not managed to bring these people together. Uh, they say partly because uh, he's an interested party in uh, that conflict. We gotta give it up to uh, Abi Ahmed and um, interestingly enough, uh, the man in Khartoum who was able to get them on the table to actually yeah. eventually sign a peace agreement. The people of South Sudan are tired of fighting of war, of dying unnecessarily, okay? It's time for these two characters, these two individuals to get their act together mm -hmm. and understand that they're working uh, for the country and not for their individual interests. Uh, let's go to another Facebook comment uh, here. Let's go to uh, Mona Amina. When the leadership is poor, misuse of natural resources by so-called leaders is inevitable. All sorts of atrocities after can't be talked about uh, for fear of death. Mm. Uh, what do you make of Accountability, that? basically, like what we talked about last time, which is, uh, you know, basically the, the, the reason we see a lot of uh, endemic corruption on the continent. You know, when leaders are not accountable to their people and how they use their resources, which is something we talked about last week, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you start asking yourself or asking the leadership to be accountable to you and understand that the wealth of the nation is as much yours as it is for the next person and that you should find a way to share the wealth, this wealth mm. among us yourselves for the benefit of the, the population in general. Uh, the reason why we see uh, that there is a backlash when you speak out is that uh, there's that culture among some of the leaders on the continent where they f they, 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 they take this uh, uh, they take whatever resources are available to them mm -hmm. and use them wherever whichever way they want because they know that you won't speak out you know, because you'll be afraid they will uh, you know you go on the street and protest and they will throw tear gas at you and then you'll give up. Uh, <laughs> okay. but, but, but that's no longer the case. There are a lot of young people who are standing up to these uh, leaders right. and saying, you know what, we won't be counted. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And maybe this is the generation that is going to make the change. Maybe this is the time uh, that we, you know, maybe you are the leaders you've been waiting for. <laughs> you know uh, what I'm saying? Uh, very quickly, there is another comment, uh, uh, Doris Agnes. Uh, Africans no longer stand in solidarity with each other, the same way it was during the uh, apartheid era. Why has the EU not come out to support the Ugandans for their struggle against Museveni? But did they say Africans are not standing up? for each other and then they say the EU in the same sentence? <laughs> you mean the AU? Did they mean to say the AU, the African Union? Probably. Because that would be another issue yeah. because, you know, when, since when did the African Union act to, <laughs> to speak out on, on behalf of the people? of the continent. I know that that is not a controversial statement to make by any measure. Okay. <laughs> well, well, Jackson, uh, uh, for those uh, who are uh, the fans of Straight Talk, uh, on Straight Talk tomorrow we'll be talking about uh, uh, the, the UNGA Assembly or UNGA Assembly, uh, the 73rd Assembly, and uh, Shaka Sali will be off, but uh, Vincent Macquarie will be sitting in for him. Uh, on that note, uh, Thank you so much uh, for uh, being with us uh, today. Jackson Nambongani, the host of uh, Upfront, uh, was filling in for Shaka. And I look forward to hosting you on another edition of uh, Shaka Extra Time next week. Thank Until you, then, uh, so long uh, from Washington. This was fun.
and manipulate